What up guys, this is Pete aka Characters and welcome back to the Character Poker Podcast for the final episode of the year 2015. Next year we're going to bring you loads more content with me and my students doing interviews, loads more cool stuff, technical poker stuff, mental game stuff, um, shooting the shit, more relaxed kind of stuff as well of course because everyone likes a good bit of that but for now we're going to stay in the realm of technical poker study for this episode and we're going to finish off 2015 by talking about one important distinction that's kind of like a prelude to the next couple of episodes of the podcast that go through the synopsis of my book, um, where I'm basically going, it's a bit more than a synopsis actually, it's a bit of like a scan, a sort of semi-detailed overview where I'm talking, if you're familiar with this podcast, you'll know that I'm going from chapter to chapter of the book, going through in this podcast series and outlining the main points um, as a kind of the way that a lecturer would present a slide on his subject matter, you'd still want to actually get the lecture if you like but it wouldn't be enough just to read the slide but the slide is a good aid to the lecture that's kind of how I'm seeing it so in this series we're doing that today we're taking a little bit of a break it's not going to be following the book exactly the content of today's podcast but I want to outline a distinction between two very common types of spot that people often confuse much to their detriment in poker Um, there are two types of broad types of poker situation that you can encounter You can encounter, first of all, what I call an end of action spot, and you can also encounter an open action spot. Now, these are terms that I've made up in the book, so in that sense, I'm staying with the content of the book in this podcast. An open action spot, sorry, an end of action spot, we'll start there, is basically as it sounds. um, When you make your decision, whether it be call, raise, fold, whatever, in an end of action spot, regardless of what that decision is, it will be the last decision made in the hand. So... An example of this would be preflop when someone shoves and you're deciding whether or not you should call in the big blind after everyone else has folded. Um, that's an end of action spot because if you call, there'll be no more action for the hand and if you fold, there'll be no more action for the hand. I mean, obviously, if you fold, there's no more action for the hand as far as you're concerned anyway. But you get the point. It doesn't matter what you do. That action will be the last. What does that mean for your decision making? Well, in an end of action spot, your decision making is pretty simple. Um, you don't have factors such as other streets to analyze and therefore we actually have a pretty clear route of deciding on the EV of plays, or at least estimating the EV of a play and whether something is likely to be plus EV, minus EV, or break even, right off the bat, simply by looking at factors such as our opponent's range paired with the pot odds that we're facing or the fold equity we think we have compared with the fold equity that we would need to make a bluff. So in this realm, I'm going to talk about two types of situation where you really need to know the process in game and out of game, how to analyze them. And that's going to come in handy when we move on next week and the week after and start talking about the actual nitty gritty of end of action spots versus open action spots. So let's start with end of action spots then. And we'll start off at the end, if you like. We'll begin at the end by looking at the river. Now, the river is usually going to be an end of action spot because on the river, when you face a bet and you're deciding whether or not you should call that bet, you know that if you call or fold, there'll be no more action for the hand. Of course, you could raise, and if you raise, that's not an end of action spot because your opponent then has another action that he can take, and that's that's somewhat different, I suppose. But for now, we'll look at the spot where we're facing a bet, and we're really just deciding between calling or folding. I suppose we have some kind of bluff catcher hand that while it has decent showdown value against bluffs, is not a hand that we would ever fathom raising for value or turning into a bluff because it's good enough to call. Um, It's going to be a call or a fold, basically. Let's say that much. So in this spot, our decision is pretty simple in terms of our process. What we're going to do here, well, let me give you an example first of a bad way to analyze whether you should call a river bet. Someone might say something like, a student may say, well, I don't know if I should call this river bet because he could be bluffing. He could easily be bluffing because he looks quite aggressive, but I just don't know that much about him, so I fold it. That's a terrible thought process. Like on the surface, you might think, oh yeah, you know, that thought process is good. The student's like being cautious because he doesn't really know what to do yet. He doesn't know his opponent, so he's erring on the side of being cautious. For a start, that's just wrong. You should always err on the side of playing against your population, not just playing against the net if your population is not full of nets. If it is, then fair enough, but never do that. But anyway, the problem with this thought process is that it is not taken into account the most fundamental part of the end of action spot in the river. When you face this bet, there is a very set, mathematically rigid, concrete value called your required equity or RE, as I like to call it. <clears throat> and your RE is always the amount of the time that you need to win the pot when you call in order to break even by making that call, not taking into account things like rake. 
So your required equity is easy to figure out. It's basically the amount that you have to call divided by that amount again plus the total pot that you stand to win, which includes villain's bet. So when villain bets $3 into $6 on the river, you need to call three and you need to call three into a pot that's already nine, six plus three. So then we need to say three divided by nine plus three because we add the amount to call on again, amount to call divided by amount to call plus total pot, which includes villain's bet already. Three into 12 is 25%. We need 25% equity to be good there. Another way that you could think about that is that we are getting three to one. Um, the amount that we need to call is a third of the total pot. Therefore, three to one, 25% to 75%. We need 25% equity to call ratio wise. So those are two ways that you can think about the situation. Um, out of game, you can do that. I mean, I picked a nice easy half pot sum there in order to work with um, quickly. But what you can do out of game with more complicated sums is just do that do that procedure, amount to call divided by amount to call plus total pot. Um, look at the pods, look at the ratio, whatever works best for you. But then in game, you're going to have to memorize some actual milestones of required equity and end of action spots. So you should know that a pot size bet means that you need 33% to call. You should know that half pot size bet means that you need 25% to call, probably a bit more due to rake and things like that. Um, so the argument of, oh, I just fold because I don't really know what's going on is just ridiculous and doesn't take into account required equity, which is the fundamental staple of the situation. You need to know your required equity first before you can start going about whether or not you meet that. Because what your brain will do in an end of action spot if you're not an experienced poker player yet, is that it will have this innate sort of conditioning that tells you that you need 50% equity to call a bet. Why is that? Because in life, things need to be better than just average in order to do them. If something's going to be profitable for us in life, we're not used to there being a pot in life, so to speak. We're used to deciding our decisions on an empty pot kind of basis. Like today, if I want to decide whether... Um, whether I should go and see my friend and play some Magic the Gathering, which is what I'm probably going to do, or whether I should stay here and clean my my house or my bedroom or something like that, then I'm not. I don't have like all these other conditions that are already in. It's not like I'm like pot committed to clean my bedroom because something bad will happen to me if I don't or anything like that. So I make this decision based on what I think is most plus EV. I think the fun I will get from going and playing Magic the Gathering is going to outweigh the benefit that I will get from my clean room. It's an empty pot situation. It's better than 50% for me. I've decided to go and play a card game instead of cleaning. Great. Awesome. But in poker, it's not like that because it doesn't need to be better than 50% for, for us to call this half pot three into six river bet. It just needs to be better than 25% because in poker, there's something going on that's tipping the scales already in one way or another, and that is that there's already this dead money in the pot. So you need to get over the brain's initial conditioning in an end of action spot that tells you that it needs to be more good than bad in an absolute basis of 50%, which is the, the typical um, balance point of what is more good than bad in order for you to do something. It doesn't. It needs to be, The balance point is shifted depending on the pots of the bet that you are calling. So first of all, just always get required equity right in your head before you start going off on a tangent of he thinks I think that blah, 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 or villain is this, or his range might be this, or I'm just going to do this because I don't know, or whatever random logic that you're applying in that spot. Um, that thought process I gave you, that model thought process was also bad um, because it didn't really take into account how often we're good against the average player. Like I said, if you don't know villain and you face a bet in a, on the river, you shouldn't go, oh, maybe he's bluffing, I should call. You shouldn't go, I don't know, therefore I should fold. You should say, well, how often does the population bluff this spot? How is the board run out? How many bluffs could be in his range? How many draws got there? How much air is still left? How likely is the population to take this line as a bluff based on my experience of playing in this game that I frequent? You know, you frequent a game, you should have an idea how much people bluff in that game in that spot. If you don't, you need to do more work on population reads. So it's a two-part process to figure out this end of action spot where we face the river bet. One, what's my required equity? Two, do I meet that? Now students say things to me sometimes like, well, how am I supposed to know how much equity I have? And I say, you're not. Of course you can't know. It's like, well, how am I even supposed to estimate whether I have 32% or 38%? How can I do that? How can I plug in a hand range in my head in-game and figure out my equity percentage to see if I meet required equity? And the answer is you don't. You shouldn't try to do that. That's ridiculous. You're not like a super poker computer with perfect information. You can't even estimate a range in the amount of time that you have to act in-game. If you want to do that analysis out of game to build up your familiarity with the situation in different ranges versus ranges in equity, that's fine. But in-game, what you need to do is you need to think of it in terms of just do I meet that target, yes or no, estimate. 
okay, I need 25%. Am I good here a quarter of the time, put into more human terms? Do I win here one in four on average in my experience of this line? If you know villain, do I win here one in four against this type of player who I've seen do X and Y? The more information you have, the more you can add to that question to help you get a more specific answer. But generally, it's much easier with 12 seconds to act to just go on one side of the fence, yes or no, than it is to like try and work out some exact equity percentage. So in these end of action spots, simplify it for yourself. Make life easy. Ask the right question. Do I have my required equity? What is my required equity? You should learn your milestones, half pot, pot size, quarter pot, third pot, two thirds pot, 28%, for example. Remember what these are and then just use that two part question. Do I have the equity that I need to call estimate it? So that's nice and simple. That's life in an end of action spot. Other examples would be pre-flop when someone shoves, um, would be when stack size is shorter and someone shoves like on the flop or someone makes a bet that you know represents their full stack so you can basically pretend that the full stack is in there. You can also turn open action spots into end of action spots as well. An open action spot um, is one where we face a bet or we're making a bet or whatever and it's not going to be well, generally in the book, I refer to these spots as spots where we face bets. That's basically what these chapters look at, open end of open action spots and end of action spots. They look at spots where we face a bet. So I'll stay within that, that realm for now. So an open action spot, as defined in the Grinders Manual, is a spot in which we face a bet and if we call, that call will not be the last action for the hand. There will be many other things that can go on in the hand, either on the flop with deeper stacks um, or we're considering raising or something like that, or this villain's going to have another decision point at some point, and oftentimes so are we. So let's take a, take a typical example. Um, villain bets the turn, pretty big, like for pot, and we have a hand with decent showdown value. Now, we just looked at that river spot, and we outlined a thought process for this, and this is where the misconception I alluded to at the start of this podcast comes in. Sometimes my students here will say, okay, well, my required equity, because he bet pot is 33%, I think I'm good here 33% of the time, so I'm going to call. It doesn't work like, th like that because we're not getting to showdown yet, and a lot of your equity may be ghost equity. It may not be realizable because every amount of equity you have will have a realize realizability factor, a realization factor, I suppose, how often you're going to be able to actually turn that equity into a hand that wins at showdown because to win at showdown, you have to call another bet. So if villain bets pot on the turn and you think that you have enough equity to call the turn, he's probably not betting the river with the same range. If he is, then it's really easy because your turn equity and your river equity are exactly the same and you know he's going to bet river, so you can just look at what those two bets combined would be and have a look at your required equity and turn it into an end of action spot. Like I say, that end of action spot technique that we just looked at of required equity, do I meet it? You can actually find ways to turn non-end of action spots into end of action spots so that you can use it. I'll do one of those in a second. But anyway, for now, when we face this turn bet against an average villain, that's to say, not a guy who we know is going to bet the river with his whole range. There's an unknown factor of what range he bets river with. We don't really know. He could shut down with a lot of his bluffs. He could continue bluffing a lot. Um, it really depends on the villain and the board texture and all these kind of things. So the point is that if we call river, call turn rather, because we think we have this 33% equity, but then we're folding to a pot-sized river bet the villain makes because we no longer think we have enough to call, then calling turn was not correct just because we had that 33%. We need a bit more equity than that due to the fact that we're not getting to showdown all the time. So you definitely need to be more strict with required equity on the turn and your required equity percentage there, if you have a static hand that's not getting any better, is going to be lower because for one, villain can continue bluffing on the river with some frequency that makes you fold the best hand sometimes. And for two, it could just be the case that villain has equity with his bluffs already and is going to continue you know, bluffing against you. So that kind of sucks for you. If you're making a call with a hand that you think is good right now, 33%, but you're not taking into account the fact that a villain can have a flush draw that gives him 20% equity, for example, on the turn, then, you know, you need a bit more equity than that to call. So it, there's a lot more factors that come into this. In an open action spot, for example, we face a bet on the flop, you need to be thinking of future fold equity as well, like how often you are, how realizable your own equity is, how much fold equity you have in the hand. For example, when we call the flop with queen high and a gut shot against a big C bet, we're not doing that in position because we think that we have enough equity to actually get the showdown and win or that we're going to win on the next street. All of a sudden, the cards are going to get flipped up. That's not going to happen. It's an open action spot, not an end of action spot. And so on the flop, we're calling because we think that we have 
fold equity later in the hand. We think that villain is CBET bluffing the flop <clears throat> often enough that he'll be check folding the turn of the river to us at some point and we'll be able to capitalize upon that and make EV from future fold equity instead. So there are all these other notions that go into those chapters. Um, end of action spots are quite simple. There are ways that we can work them out quite easily. Open action spots are not. But like I said, there are times when we can bring the two together and actually solve an open action spot by turning it into an end of action spot. It's like back in school when you did math and there was a type of equation that you'd never seen before and you didn't know how to solve it, but you could turn it into one that you had seen before and then you could solve it. Or like in chess where there's like standard positions in the end game where if you get into the Lucina position, it's like a brook ending in chess, you know you can win that ending um, when you get when you get to it, but you don't know if the position is one in front of you on the board, but yet you know that there's a way to get into the Lucina position, therefore you know you can win it. So it's like that in poker too. You can get to a, you could face another spot on the turn, for example, which presents itself as an open action spot. For example, there's a very tight passive fish against whom you've bet flop and turn with, let's say, a flush draw. And you're trying to like get full equity on the turn when you bet against this fish. And the fish raises, min raises the turn, and you know that this player type has a very, very strong range when he does this. He takes this death line, as I call it. He has, like, probably two pair plus most of the time, at least top pair, top kicker most of the time he does this, or some huge combo draw or something. Um, so you know that your equity is very, very low. You know that you know that you basically have to make your flush to win. You know that you have no fold equity at all against his range. So basically the spot becomes end of action because... You can basically just play the river completely fit or fold. You know that you're only getting to showdown when you make your flush and you are winning when you make your flush most of the time, or at least like an extremely massive amount of times that the times you get flush over flush are just too insignificant to matter greatly. So what you can do here is you can say, all right, villains bet, villains raised, min raised my turn bet. I bet 10 into 12 on the turn and he's min raised me to 20. So it's like another 10 for me to call and the pot is already really big, so you can work out required equity here. You're getting like four to one or something. You're only going to need like twenty percent, and you can you can say, okay, yeah, I'm clearly going to make my hand. Um, it's actually a bad example because this is actually open action because you need to factor in implied odds there as well. Like say there's money behind, um, but then you can actually turn it into end of action again because you can say, and I think that villain's range is so strong that I just make his other thirty dollars on the river every time I call and make my flush. So you can then add that onto the pot on the turn and you can treat it like villain has, like you know what's going to happen on the river. Whenever you can predict the next street, you can treat it like end of action. You can just say, okay, what's my required equity? I'm just going to grab all that money that I, I'm going to win from villain stack on the river. If I get there, I'm going to add it onto the pot on the turn. I'm going to pretend that it's like an end of action spot where I'm just getting a really, really good price. So you can use that technique of <clears throat> amount to call divided by amount to call plus total pot very easily to go ahead and solve the situation, turn it into an end of action spot, even if it presents itself as an open action spot. But the, the point from this podcast, the main point is that you need to have a clear distinction between those two types of situation, basically. Some spots are end of action, some spots are open action. Don't make the mistake of just going, okay, my pot odds are this, therefore I can call on the flop. There are so many other factors you need to think about. It's not just, don't oversimplify poker in an open action spot. Save that kind of simple technique for the end of action spots or the spots that you've manipulated in your head to turn them into those end of action spots that math is comes in handy um the amount to call divided by amount to call plus total pot or if you're the one making the bluff then it's risk divided by risk plus reward like we talked about in the stealing part <coughs> of this podcast series um so hopefully that's a good tool for you to to practice over the next few weeks when you're playing poker work on that sort of think about whether a spot is end of action or open action. And if it's end of action where you're facing this bet, you've got a very clear way that you can think about it. Make sure your thought process follows that that kind of pattern that you're estimating your or you're solving for your required equity straight away and you're estimating whether or not you meet that equity. Okay, I just wanted to set that up for this. We can do a short segment on that. And then next week we'll get into some actual situations, some concrete stuff where we talk about end of action spots first. Then the week after we'll talk about some open action spots and we'll build on this and put some more meat on these bones that we've created today. Um in the new year, I'm going to be taking on loads more new students. I'll be selling coaching packages in, you know, um, blocks of 5, 10, 25. You can find pricing on my website, carrotconnor.com. Love to work with some of you listeners in the new year on your game. Can't emphasize enough just how valuable it can be to have, like, guided instruction goals set for you in coaching, that kind of thing. So if you are interested in coaching, do check out my website. 
and shoot me an email at admin at carrotcorner.com. I'd love to hear from you guys both on that. Also, ideas for future podcast segments, whatever as well. Feel free to keep all that coming, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Good luck at the tables. Feel like a star, like a star, like a star. I said,